In the top stories, government's town hall meetings continue in Saddlers. More artists revealed for St. Kitts Music Festival. And Department of Agriculture holds annual review and planning meeting. The details on these stories and more after the break. Can you afford to lose everything? In times of uncertainty, ensure you have the security of Quartz Payment Protection. When you shop with Quartz Ready Finance Gold or Ultimate Plan, if you lose your job after six months of making payments, our redundancy coverage ensures that the payment on your account continues for up to 12 months. Don't risk losing everything. Shop with Quartz Ready Finance and get the payment protection plan that protects you against redundancy, disability, death, and loss of item due to natural disaster fire, flood, or theft. Courts Ready Finance with Payment Protection. Courts, bringing value home. Hello and welcome to the Zeraiza Channel 5 newscast. I'm Carla Barrage. Continuing in the spirit of its second anniversary in office, the Team Unity Administration is hosting its seventh in a series of public forums dubbed Good Governance and Accountability for Prosperity on Tuesday, February 28th at the Saddlers Primary School at 7.30 p.m. Prime Minister Dr. The Honorable Timothy Harris will be joined by Attorney General Honorable Vincent Byron. Minister of Public Infrastructure, Honorable Ian Lybert, and Minister of Human Settlement, Honorable Eugene Hamilton, who will give an account of their stewardship in bringing about the prosperity agenda for the people of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. Nationals and residents are invited to attend and voice questions and concerns as these town hall meetings are by the people and for the people. My pledge as a country's Prime Minister is that I always will remain humble, available, and accessible, not only to my beloved constituents of St. Christopher 7, but to all our citizens and residents of St. Kitts and Nevis. I cherish your advice, your constructive criticism, and I say, come play a role. Help us make St. Kitts and Nevis the best small island state in the world. Live coverage will be provided by ZLZ Television Channel 5 in St. Kitts and 98 in Nevis and Radio 95.9, 96.1, 96.3 and 96.9 .9 FM. The event will also be streamed online at www.zizonline.com and the St. Kitts and Nevis Information Service SKNIS Facebook page. The St. Kitts Music Festival Committee has announced the second wave of artists that will be featured during this year's event. In a press release issued on Tuesday morning, the committee listed soca artist Ricardo Drew, Tedison John, lyrical and voice, as well as reggae performers Felicia Ross, Ed Robinson, and Third World. They joined Mavado, Jack Hua, Shabaranks, and the Goo Goo Dolls, who were announced in a press conference in January. The final roster, with all remaining performers to be announced, is expected to be released in the coming weeks. The St. Kitts Music Festival, which was started in 1996, will be held from June 22nd to 24th at the Warner Park Cricket Stadium in Bastyr. The Department of Agriculture held its annual review and planning meeting for stakeholders on Tuesday at the Department of Agriculture Conference Room. In his address, Director of Agriculture Melvin James said he is pleased with the advancement of his department since its previous review in 2016. By trying to fulfill the broad objectives that were stated in this document, saying that by this time, meaning at the end of 2016, Agriculture will be innovative, it will be resilient, sustainable, supporting food and nutrition security, viable livelihoods, economic linkages, and biodiversity conservation. These goals, not expressed in quantifiable terms, have been met to some extent, but there still is much to be achieved. In keeping with the spirit of the ADS, also in attendance was the Minister of Agriculture, Honorable Eugene Hamilton, 
who stressed on the importance of greenhouse production by farmers, which is heavily funded by his government. I am not quite happy with the output of those who have greenhouses on their farms. It is an area that must be addressed in this 2017, even if it means relocating those greenhouses. If you do not produce using this expensive gift from the government, we will have to have it relocated. The annual review meeting also included presentations from the Ministry of Trade, Livestock Production Officers and Livestock Farmers. It was held under the theme, Boosting Efficiency in the Face of a Changing Environment. Attorney General Honorable Vincent Byron says the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court serves an important role in shaping and molding the country's jurisprudence as there have been hundreds of constitutional matters, thousands of court decisions, and hundreds of judgments that have taken place. The court is celebrating its 50th anniversary, and to commemorate the event, a special court session was held on Monday at the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court. The celebration, which is being held under the theme, Embracing the Past, Celebrating the Future, is an important occasion in the life of St. Kitts and Nevis, the Attorney General said. He noted that the theme is suitable upon reflection of the rich history of St. Kitts and Nevis and its people. He said that the struggles we have faced and the challenges we have overcome through perseverance, faith and resilience are what make up the country's affluent history. The celebration began with a service on February 26 at the Wesley Methodist Church, Bastia. The Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, ECSC, is a Supreme Court of Record for the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, OECS. After the break, a tourism ministry hosts Open Your Hat outreach event, and Nevis officials and UNESCO launch a project to strengthen community steel pan groups. We'll tell you more when we come back. As part of its one-year anniversary celebrations, the Heart of St. Kitts Foundation held a Port Zante outreach event on Tuesday as part of its fundraising initiative. Zarazet spoke with Sustainable Development Tourism Specialist at the Ministry of Tourism, Annette Escobar, who explained why the organization decided to host the event. We're celebrating the first um, anniversary of the Heart of St. Kitts Foundation and that's an entire week of events and today and tomorrow we're doing outreach on Port Zante. So we're really trying to raise the awareness for both locals and business owners as well as the tourists coming on and off the cruise ships and hopefully raising some funds to support those local projects around the island. She also explained why it was important for persons to participate in the Heart of St. Kitts week of activities. The reason that people should participate in the Heart of St. Kitts Week is that the foundation is, their whole goal is to make St. Kitts a better place to live and experience. And that's good for everybody, for locals, business owners, tourists, everyone benefits from this. And we are focusing on projects as close to the hearts of the locals and the community members. And that's who we're really working to support. So by, by joining the events of the Heart of St. Kitts Week, by going to the partner restaurants, by coming out to the outreach, the beach cleanup, the sunset cruise, what you're really doing is leaving a legacy on St. Kitts. The week of activities continues with the branding of the Black Rocks bus stop in Bellevue on Thursday. The Heart of St. Kitts one-year anniversary activities are being held under the theme, Open Your Heart, Leave a Legacy. The Premier's Ministry in Nevis is partnering with UNESCO in a project entitled Development and Sustainability of Community-Based Steel Pen Groups. Assistant Secretary in the Premier's Ministry, Kevin Barrett, said that the project will run over three weekends and is the brainchild of Premier of Nevis, Honorable Vance Amory. Funded by UNESCO, the Premier's Ministry put together a committee to spearhead the project, which comprises of music teacher Rohan Claxton, who is coordinator of the project, Dominique Honders, secretary, Tracy Paris, community liaison officer from the St. George's Parish, Zanella Claxton, director of youth development, 
Eric Evelyn, president of the Empire Sports and Social Club, and Keith Scarborough from the Nevis Cultural Development Foundation. The first phase of the project was launched on Thursday at Bath Hotel with a steel pen training workshop for over 20 young persons. The group will be taught various techniques in playing steel pen and overall development in terms of how to teach the steel pen. At the end of the training, the Gingerland community will be the first to benefit from training to form a community steel pan group. Students of various schools now have a better understanding of sustainable tourism and how it impacts St. Kitts thanks to a tourism education awareness program organized by the Ministry of Tourism. Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Tourism, Colleen Henry Morton, said her ministry has taken a people-centered approach to tourism sector development with emphasis on service training and education. The Permanent Secretary also said it is important that they do all in their power to engage the youth as they will be preserving and safeguarding the industry for future generations. Once a week, the class learns different aspects of tourism as part of the ministry's Tourism Education Awareness Program. The Tourism Education Program is currently taking place at the Sandy Point Primary School, the Dr. William Connor Primary School, Bastia High School, and the Advanced Vocational Educational Center, AVEC. Coming up, thousands of Haitian migrants stranded at the U.S.-Mexico border. The details when we come back. While the United States moves to deport undocumented immigrants, border cities in Mexico are experiencing an immigration crisis of their own as Haitian migrants have found themselves stranded and unable to enter the U.S. due to strict new policies. Hesma. Haitian immigrants, thousands of them, fled their country in 2010 after a devastating earthquake. Many moved to Brazil. But an economic crisis there led to their decision to travel more than 8,000 kilometers over land in a desperate attempt to enter the U.S. without documents. 35-year-old Christopher Faustine came with his wife and daughter. He now finds himself among thousands of other Haitians scraping by to earn a living in the Mexican border city of Tijuana. Right now, it is impossible to go to the United States. The new administration there is deporting all people who enter with no papers. It's not worth the risk. It's better for us to stay in Mexico. Many Haitians moved to this Tijuana neighborhood called Scorpion Canyon. Here, housing is scarce and wastewater washes over dirt roads, creating poor sanitary conditions. The Haitian migrants, which some people refer to as refugees, have fled one of the most poor countries in all of Latin America, only to find themselves here in one of the most poverty-stricken zones in northern Mexico. Border are still Nicole Ramos is a U.S. attorney based in Tijuana. She says many Haitian immigrants lack information to pursue asylum claims in the U.S. So many of them are not aware that they're going to be immediately detained, um, some for a few days, some for weeks and several months. So that in itself is a shock to their system because they're thinking, I'm coming here for help, I'm not a criminal, I'm not coming here to do harm. The Haitians we spoke with for this report say they're now planning to seek permanent residency in Tijuana. For them, returning to the extreme poverty in Haiti is no option. I spent so much money to get here. Return to Haiti, for me, that would be very difficult. They share another meal at the church, but church officials say food and medicine supplies are running low and the situation is taking on all the characteristics of an immigration crisis. Frank Contreras, CGTN, Tijuana, Mexico. Coming up, Samsung chief indicted in bribery scandal. The details when we come back. Hello and welcome to another edition of Upfront. With me in the studio is Chanel Charles, and Chanel is the senior gender officer with responsible for the Women's Empowerment Platform. How are you? 
I'm good, thank you. It's a pleasure having you. Okay, Indeed. so you're here to speak with us about International Women's Day. Yes. Okay, so can you tell me what exactly is International Women's Day and what is that specific day all about? Okay, International Women's Day is celebrated annually each year and it's normally on the 8th of March. Um, last year, our theme was Pledge for, par for Parity and this year the theme would be Be Bold for Change. You know, um, in, in the community, you know, women are not you know, recognized as much as we would like them to be um, recognized for the stuff that they do right. mm -hmm. in the community and our country at large. So it's a day where we celebrate, you know, we celebrate women, as I would say. What exactly inspired that theme? Be bold. What does that mean? Before, I would say that women would stand back in the background, mm -hmm. but be bold, come out, stand out, you know. The things that you wanted to do before, you can do now. You can be anything you want to be as a woman. You could be a prime minister now, you know, in Barbados or in the Caribbean countries, there are women now that are standing out um, as prime ministers, right, you right. know, doctors, you know, anything that you want to be. I think we, we can be. <laughs> and go for it. <laughs> and go for it. <laughs> That's right. You better include me, girl. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so tell me, you guys should be having activities to commemorate this day. Yes. Uh, we, we would start off the month of March with a church service, you know, which is most important, you mm -hmm. know, God, to include in everything that we do. Um, we would also have on the 8th, that's when we celebrate, International Women's Day, we would have a award ceremony where we pick, you know, women from different categories, for example, like construction law, and we would award them for over the years for the things that they have done and the community service. I right? like that. Mm -hmm. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mm. We would also be showcasing the two oldest women in the Federation one in St. Kitts and one in Nevis, they will talk about, you know, f growing up from small and talking about um, the experiences that they, they had um, as women, um, struggles, workforce, family, everything. And that would start early in the month, maybe from the 1st of March. Okay. We would have that. We would also have a um, round table discussion. Mm -hmm. I think you would like this. <laughs> the role of men and women in the home. Hi. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> that should be quite interesting. And we are also will be partnering with the Alliance France where they would show a movie. And the movie is entitled um, Women Are Heroes. Oh. Yes. I think that you know the public should come out and mm -hmm. come to the movie, see what it's all about, you know, because I, I I'm like really not want to know mm -hmm. this movie and what it is what about. What it's all about. Yes, definitely. Women are heroes. Women I'm, I'm are liking heroes. this. Mm -hmm. I'm really. Li I hope we have a lot of men who are paying attention. <laughs> I think they would more want to listen to the round table mm -hmm. and give, you know they could give the views and they could call in and they could talk about you know their own views, what they think and things like that. And I like that you guys are also encouraging men to take part. Yes. In the definitely. activities as well. I Definitely. like that. So is there anything in particular that you would <coughs> like anyone else, well, those who are listening and paying attention to know about your activities or your celebrations? Yes, there are other um, activities that we would be doing, like a rally we would have. We, we are partnering with the Ministry of Health. That would be in the square. That would be on the 10th of March. So come on out and see what the Ministry of Health and Gender would be doing. It should be quite interesting. And it's about women's health, actually. That's what they are probably focusing on for this year, women's health. Uh, they will be doing screenings like pap smears, mm -hmm. um, blood pressure, taking right. the blood pressure and things like that. I think that is so important for us. Same here as well, especially for me, like a thickums like me. <laughs> no, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> okay, Chanel, thank you so much for joining us here on Upfront. Yes. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you. I hope to see you at the movie. Yes, you will. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Okay. <laughs> That's it for Upfront. I am Shaira Flanders. Stay tuned. More news is next. Can you afford to lose everything? 
In times of uncertainty, ensure you have the security of Quartz Payment Protection. When you shop with Quartz Ready Finance Gold or Ultimate Plan, if you lose your job after six months of making payments, our redundancy coverage ensures that the payment on your account continues for up to 12 months. Don't risk losing everything. Shop with Quartz Ready Finance and get the payment protection plan that protects you against redundancy, disability, death, and loss of item due to natural disaster disaster, fire, flood, or theft. Courts Ready Finance with Payment Protection. Courts Bringing Value Home. South Korean prosecutors have charged the head of Samsung Group with bribery and embezzlement. Lee Jae-yong, who was arrested earlier this month, will now stand trial for allegedly paying $36 million to businesses backed by President Park's Gion Hai's friend, Chu Soon Sil. Al Jazeera's Harry Fawcett reports from Seoul. Twelve days after J.Y. Lee, South Korea's most powerful business figure, was taken into detention, he faces the prospect of many months in a cell, awaiting trial for bribery, embezzlement and perjury. On the last day of their sprawling investigation into South Korea's presidential scandal, special prosecutors named Lee among 17 people to be newly indicted. The prosecutor's spokesman said Lee, along with four other senior executives, would be indicted on charges, including bribery, aggravated economic crime, embezzlement, hiding money in properties abroad, and concealment of criminal proceeds. Lee and his fellow executives are accused of approving payments of $36 million to foundations and companies linked to Choi Sun Sil to win government backing for a crucial merger. Choi, a longtime friend of the president, is currently on trial for bribery, coercion and abuse of power. Samsung Electronics says it made the payments but calls accusations of bribery, quote, groundless. And it's announced the disbanding of its future strategy office, which, combined with complex cross-shareholdings, has allowed the founding family to control the giant conglomerate, or Chebol. It says Samsung affiliates will now run autonomously. Until now, their power has been strictly limited. Those kind of limitations are not imposed by the uh, legal or corporate law kind of thing. It is imposed by the kind of un unofficial cultural thing called the Chebol. This all matters so much here because Samsung matters so much to the national economy. Its electronics division accounts for about 20% of South Korea's exports. In the past, J.Y. Lee's father was granted a presidential pardon after being convicted of a financial crime in the national interest. Even though impeached, the current president, Park Geun-hye, continues to enjoy immunity from prosecution. Special prosecutors instead booked her as a suspect, detailing her conversations with J.Y. Lee. If her impeachment is confirmed by the Constitutional Court due to rule within the next two weeks, she too could be charged. Harry Fawcett, Al Jazeera, Seoul. Former Republican U.S. President George W. Bush diverged sharply from Trump's new administration on Monday, saying he supported a welcoming immigration policy and praising the media as indispensable to democracy. Former President George W. Bush is defending the role of the free press in American politics. I, I consider the media, media to be indispensable to democracy. During an interview on the Today Show Monday, Bush said he supports the media because it holds people in positions of power accountable for their actions. But he acknowledged that the press operates much differently than when he was in the Oval Office. And now there's all kinds of uh, information being bombarded out and people can say things anonymously and it's just, a, it's just a different world. Bush's stance on the subject is very different from that of fellow Republican President Donald Trump. A few days ago I called the fake news the enemy of the people and they are. They are the enemy of the people. Trump and his administration have repeatedly condemned the media, calling some legacy outlets fake news and declaring the media the opposition party. But Bush's own relationship with the media hasn't always been so great. Throughout his time in office, he was often criticized for keeping reporters at arm's length. Up next in sports, family and friends pay their final respects to the late Stedward Teixeira and West Indies take on England at Warner Park. Stay tuned.
Students, teachers, and friends joined family members on Tuesday afternoon at Wanapak for the funeral service of teacher and sports official Stedoy Tishera. Tishera's body was found in his house on Wednesday, February 15th, after he reportedly died of a heart attack. Tishera was a coach and physical education teacher at Washington Archibald High School for almost 32 years. He was also an official of the St. Kitts Nevis Football Association and refereed numerous matches in various leagues. Tishera was also a sports correspondent for ZIZ Broadcasting Corporation, providing scores and updates on matches across the country. The management and staff of ZIZ Broadcasting Corporation extends deepest sympathy to the family of Stedroy Tishera. Monday, 27th February, saw the England touring team engaging the West Indies Cricket Board's President 11 in a 50 overs a side encounter at Wanapak in St. Kitts. The home team won the toss and elected to bat first and were off to a solid start with Kyle Hope and Monson Hodge playing securely to take them to 41 for no loss. Then it happened. Hodge flicked at Plunkett only to see the leaping fielder a short backward square take a superb catch. From 41 for no loss, it soon became 55 for 5 as the incoming batsman made a steady procession to and from the pavilion. However, skipper Jamal Hamilton was joined by his vice-captain, Rakeem Cornwall, and the pair not only set about to repair the damage, but did so with some authority, with both hitting huge maximums and turning over the strike with some degree of ease. Later, Kyle Myers also stayed around with his captain for some time to help to get the total over the 200 mark. England lost opener Sam Billings early in the chase and at 11 for 1, it was still anybody's game. However, Johnny Bairstow and Joe Wood came together in a decisive partnership of 111 runs, but when Wood was caught behind, it triggered a slide which saw six wickets falling for 49 runs and the home team was cock -a hoop Chris Wokes then played a cameo which took the game away from the home team and got them to victory with just seven balls remaining. The scores, WICB President's 11, 233 of 48, England 234 for 8 of 48.5 overs. A Baltimore Ravens player was arrested Sunday morning on drug charges. More in this report. Baltimore Ravens safety Matt Ellum was arrested Sunday morning on drug charges. Ellum was booked at the Turner Guilford Knight Correctional Center in Miami on charges of possession of more than 20 grams of marijuana and possession with intent to sell or deliver. He also was charged with reckless driving. Ellum was initially pulled over for reckless driving and was found with three grams of oxycodone and 126 grams of marijuana in his car. Ellum is currently being held on a $15,500 bond. When we come back, we'll have another look at the stories that made the headlines. Recapping the top stories, government town hall meetings continue in Saddlers, more artists revealed for St. Kitts Music Festival, and Department of Agriculture holds annual review and planning meeting. And that's the end of the ZRZ Channel 5 newscast. Thank you for joining us. I'm Carla Barrage. Goodbye.